Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone here. We are about to start hearing number eight of this 181st period of sessions that is virtual once again, unfortunately. We hope that very soon we will have uh, in-person hearings once again, but in the meantime, we will say on this platform, the objective of this regional hearing is to deal with the situation of human rights of children, indigenous children and adolescents in boarding schools in the region. This hearing was requested by civil society organizations called Disability Rights International, Proyecto Paz y Dignidad México, and ASTAN Colombia. We would like to welcome them. And we would like to thank you for having requested this hearing on a topic that unfortunately um, continues to exist in countries in the region. So we thank you for calling our attention to that. Today I am joined, I am Antonio Rejola, the president of the commission and the rapporteur for indigenous peoples. And I am joined by the first vice president, commissioner Julissa Mantilla, by Commissioner Esmeralda Arrosemena, who is the Rapporteur for the Rights of Children, and Commissioner Margaret May McCauley, who, among other things, is the Rapporteur for the Rights of Women. We also have the Moniton Secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, the Rapporteur for ESCE Rights, Soledad Garcia Muñoz, specialists from the executive secretariat who work with children and indigenous peoples and the entire team of the executive secretariat that make it possible for us to hold this meeting in this platform. As Vanessa mentioned, we have interpreting services. If you look at the little screen on the right hand, on the um, little world, um, little globe, you will see uh, the, the languages you just prefer. Since this is a regional hearing, the state is not here. So first of all, the civil society will have 30 minutes to make their presentation. Then the commission will make some comments and afterwards you will have another 80, um, 30 minutes to uh, wrap up. Executive Secretary Tania Renault is also here. So if there aren't any questions, you will see a little timer that will uh, show you how much time you have. If um, you go over the allotted time, I will let you know. If there are no questions, then I will give the floor to the civil society organizations, please. Uh, introduce yourselves and those who are not speaking, please turn your microphones off. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, um, Commission, for having granted us this hearing on the situation of the human rights of indigenous children in the residential schools in the region. We thank you for your being here and the staff of the executive secretariat, as well as those who are here with us through uh, via Zoom. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Eric Rosenthal. He's the executive secretary of Disability Rights International, and he will be providing some context on the situation that has gathered us here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the Commission um, for hearing this very important issue. Uh, the world press has brought attention to the enormous, vast atrocities facing uh, Indigenous children who have been placed in boarding schools. Um, in Canada alone, 150,000 children were placed in boarding schools, and there are estimates of 15,000 deaths and the recent news of more than a thousand unmarked graves um, have reinforced the dangers of what these children have faced. Canada has begun a process, um, but not completed it. 
They've created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that allowed for thousands of hours of testimonies to people to come forward and tell their stories and to begin to get the word out. Importantly, that Truth and Reconciliation Commission found that the intentional practice of obliterating cultures, of forcibly placing children in boarding schools amounted nothing less than what they called cultural genocide. Now, while there have been some reparations and there has been an apology on the part of the government, litigation continues. And the uh, First Nation people of Canada believe that much more still needs to come forward to understand the full nature of the dangers, the abuse, the deaths, and the intentional obliteration of a culture that happened in Canada. We in the United States, as an American, I'm very ashamed to say that we have a, a parallel and similar uh, uh, practice. And while the Carlisle School was the first uh, boarding school for children, apparently the Canadians came to study our school system, our segregated school system uh, that was built on the very principle of literally kill the Indian and save the man. Over the American history of placing children in boarding schools, there have been more than 300 similar schools under federal control. In 1926, 83% of all children, indigenous children, uh, went through uh, boarding schools. Sad to say, there are still schools remaining that are under federal control in three states, 15 schools uh, where children, indigenous children are placed off the reservation. And one could say that the cultural genocide is at some level still taking place. There is some growing awareness. Deb Holland, the first interior secretary in the United States, who is herself a Native American, has created a federal initiative to look at the boarding school situation and legislation has been entered into Congress as of September of this year to create a truth and healing commission. And importantly, the largest Native American organizations have strongly endorsed that. The process has begun, but there is much more to be done both to achieve truth and justice. Now you may ask why it is that Disability Rights International and other disability organizations in the Americas have called attention to this issue. We very much stand with the Native American, uh, First Nation and indigenous people in demanding truth and justice, but we have good reason for doing so. There is number one, enormous overlap between the placement of children with disabilities in boarding schools and institutions and the placement of indigenous people. And when one looks at the broader scope, it is possible to see that this is not a problem limited to Canada and the United States. And while there has been some effort at limiting these practices in Canada and the United States, there is a vast, vast pattern of segregation, abuse, exploitation, and I believe, we believe, ultimately crimes against humanity, against both people with disabilities and indigenous people throughout the Americas. You are going to hear testimony today about some of our findings from Mexico and Colombia. I can tell you that I personally, having visited institutions in Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, Paraguay, Peru, have seen that many institutions that are theoretically designated for children with disabilities have high rates of placement of indigenous people. It is impossible to understand the broad pattern of placing indigenous children in institutions without also looking at institutions for children with disabilities. It is therefore our recommendation and the major call that we are asking this commission to conduct an investigation and a thematic report that looks broadly at the problem of boarding schools throughout the Americas, that does not silo the problem into a small problem here of indigenous children or children with disabilities. We ask you to take a broad approach 
to look at the broad problem of children in institutions and the situation in boarding schools. We are going to hear from a member of the UN CRPD committee. There is an important legal standard that has been developed under international law. The CRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, has taken a strong stand, number one, that all children have a right to inclusive education as part of the general healthcare system. So it is not enough just to provide what is called education, but segregated education is a human rights violation. All people with disabilities have a right to participate in society. And the CRPD committee has said that the right to live as part of society for a child means a right to live and grow up in a family. The legal standards out of the disability world have important ramifications for the placement of uh, any child, be they indigenous or disabled, in an institution. Whereas there was a time when government authorities would say, kill the Indian, save the man. There is now a higher level of sophistication where they will never admit that they are trying to wipe out a civilization or kill the Indian. One must look past that. They now frame this as social policy for the benefit of the child, as providing education that cannot otherwise be provided. And that is why both the disability legal standards and the experience helps to cut through the bureaucratic language to understand what is truly happening. And our experience is that whenever a child is separated from their family, there is dangerous emotional trauma. Extensive science shows that all institutions are inherently dangerous. There cannot be a clean institution. It is not okay just to say, oh, let's make sure that the indigenous institutions are nice and clean and are well-staffed and have uh, excellent conditions. We now know the trauma of taking a child away from their family will cause emotional and psychological damage to that child and we are also finding to the communities from which they are taken away. They result in cognitive and intellectual disabilities. And again, in our experience, high rates of violence, exploitation, forced labor, trafficking. Our reports from Mexico, Guatemala and throughout the Americas have found that again and again. We have called the practices, the knowing and intentional practices of putting children in institutions, a form of crime against humanity. It meets the international standards. The problem is vast. The enormity of the problem is there and it is knowing. Governments know that their policies will result in these dangers towards children. We must hold them responsible. We would call on this commission, not only to engage in a fact-finding process, but a careful legal analysis to examine when it is that this rises to being a crime and when it is that a social policy is a human rights violation, not a school, but an institution. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Eric. Eh, damos la palabra ahora a Amalia. Thank you, Gamier. Eric. Now we will give the floor to Amalia Gamirias. She is the president on the, of the committee uh, for people with disabilities from the UN, and she will be talking about the international standards on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indigenous children with disabilities, how many violations against their rights? They, there must be a before and an after the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That shows clearly the difference in the approach for people with um, disabilities, and it brings it to a human rights approach. The Convention is an international by, binding legal instrument that not, must be complied with. States that have ratified this convention are under the legal obligation to protect all the rights of all persons with disabilities. It must be seen as the um, as part of the general principles proclaimed on Article 3. The first one is a respect for individuality, individual autonomy, including the freedom to make their own decisions and people's independence, the protection of children with disabilities is 
uh, appears on Article 7 of the Commission and the um, great importance of family life for them is on Article 23, which discusses uh, their home and their families and says that states, the states must provide services and support to children with disabilities and their families so as to prevent neg uh, negligence and segregation. They must make sure that children are not taken away from their parents against their will. Article 19 and its general observation number five are fundamental since they refer to the right to an independent life in community. Of course, that goes against the segregation of children with disabilities. There are studies by the committee, as Eric mentioned, by the um, organizations like Disability Rights International that are very clear in showing human rights violations of the children uh, with disabilities in these institutions, uh, terrible conditions, um, bad food, feeding habits, isolation, solitary isolation, um, incarcerations, and sexual violence relations. All of this is torture. They do This does not comply with Articles 14, 15, 16, and 17 of the Convention. States must make sure that parents with disabilities and parents of children with disability receive financial support since they are usually uh, in a situation of poverty and joblessness. Then states need to make sure they have support in the community to provide for their children. They need to be informed in order to prevent this institutionalization. They, states must ensure children will not be uh, taken from their parents. And if they cannot stay with their parents, there should be um, shelters or uh, they should be sent to their extended families. We're talking about um, these institutions with over 100 residents or even small homes with four or five people. These independent or independent housings, they cannot mean independent living because whether big or small, they are particularly dangerous for children with disabilities. For over 20 years, since the beginning of the war of the draft of this committee, we have said that um, children with disabilities must not be institutionalized because the convention goes against since the commission sorry since the convention goes against institutionalization why does this continue to happen now with regards to the importance and the uncompliance uh, so that children won't be sent to these institutions we created a specific group uh, to bring them out of institutions. During 2021, we carried out public consultations about persons with disabilities in all region, and they interacted with experts in order to provide them with resources to draft these guidelines to disinstitutionalize people. They were uh, drafted uh, in coordination with the Global Coalition, and they will be sent to the state's party for, so that they comply with these guidelines. So in summary, children with disability have a right, and the states have an obligation to be heard. They have the right to say who they want to live with. They have the right to make their own decisions. There are many examples of persons with disabilities um, who even uh, who um, they were thought not to be uh, fit for living in society. And the opposite has been proved. An example of that is Stephen Hawking's, but there are many examples like that. And in summary, the convention goes, is totally against the institutionalization of children with disabilities and their terrible consequences for their um, social, vital, and physical development. We will continue to fight for this until dignity becomes a habit. Thank you. Gracias a la vicepresidenta del Comité de la ONU por eh, uh, hablarnos sobre estos estándares de discapacidad. Thank you for speaking about these standards. Then, I, then we're going to say how they're related to children, indigenous people, and boarding schools now. Laura Cota will present. She's the founder of the project Paz in Dignidad. It is a, an organization founded in Mexico to warranty the access to education of 
to indigenous children. Thank you, Laura, for being here. You have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I belong to two of the tribes. Sorry, but there are connection issues with the speaker. We work with the organization Proyecto Paz and Divisa in order to reach to the communities and to take into account their language, customs, and traditions. In our state, in Baja California, sorry, Laura, I think there are some technical issues. Probably, if you turn off the video, the, the audio quality gets better. Is it better now? Yes. Shall I start once again? We hear a little bit, but probably you can. That you, you said that you belong to the Kumaya group in the north of the state. Yes, I belong to one of the two groups in the states. And now I am the founder of uh, and the director of the project Pasa y Dignidad, which was founded with the, the end of spreading the use and the customs of the tribes of Baja California. We want to preserve their education and our language is not written everything is oral and the family bonds in our communities there are young people that come to teach children who are who receive a grant by CONAFE they are students from secondary school and they are offered a grant in order to keep on studying. So the quality of education in the community is really deficient. There are, we need teachers who speak our language because if not, we are at risk of losing our language. There are only two speakers now in our in one of the communities so it's practically a dead language we are working in order to support education we have a foster home in the city because we live in the mountains we have to travel during three hours in order to reach the cities when the when the climate is good because during winter, we have even more problems to get there. We are working in the inclusion as well with our children, young people. We have little children with other, with different abilities. Those are children that are not being treated as they should. The school in Mexico became compulsory, so this forces children in the community to be separated from their homes and they lead to the loss of identity because they go to foster homes or to places where they can live during um, school days. And in those places, there is nobody who speaks our language. So we lose everything, our customs, our traditions, and our communities during the school year. There are only 
uh, in our communities, there are only children who are not at school and old people. And we need to take care of our elderly because they are the ones that have the knowledge and can convey that knowledge. We have those two great hurdles when they send young people who are who receive a grant and they are uh, they get a grant in order to keep on studying but and to educate people but these young people do not have the training needed in order to teach and sometimes they have their children in one single room that even though there are not many students it's difficult to have one teacher with 30 or 40 students but two students are from the first year two other students are from the second year so it's really difficult for teachers to deal with these kinds of situations so that is why we are making this call so that you can address our problem so that our education keeps of be, keeps being of quality. We need your attention. That is why we're here to join our forces and so that you can hear us. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Laura was also saying that children have to walk up to two hours in order to get to school. And there are lots of risks that they face. There are girls that have been abused while they were going to school. And if the mothers decide not to send their children to school, the children are separated from their families. They are removed from their families and they're sent to these boarding schools. And it's really difficult then for mothers to recover their children. So the work that Dignity and Peace Project does of looking for conditions of education, conditions that adapt to their culture and to their traditions is really important in order to prevent the separation of the children from their family and the placement of the children in those institutions. Thank you, Laura. We are also joined by Monica Cortez from Us Down Colombia, who will also speak about the situation of residential school in Colombia in the Amazons for children and indigenous people. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, the Commission, for receiving us and for letting us carry out this investigation, this research, because in Aston, Colombia, we are activists for inclusive education and we are really uh, near this uh, proceeding in the country that has to do with the educational process. And in the consultation with Isabel from Rights International, we found that in Colombia there are over 35,000 Colombian children and adolescents living in rural areas, hard to reach areas, that keep on receiving the ed their education through boarding schools. It was called boarding school up to four years ago, and now they're called school residents. But when we carry out the research, school residents, it's just a change of name. The structure is the same. The reasons for which the children go to these places is the distance between their uh, houses and the institutional uh, facilities, which can be up to 150 kilometers. When the distance is of, of more than one hour, they are offered this modality. And this forces students to stay for the whole week 
or longer in the boarding schools. According to the Ministry of Education, in most cases, the sites are not adequate in terms of infrastructure, equipment, housing, school meals, teacher training, and other spaces are not adequate because they are in a widespread area where control of the Ministry of Education doesn't get there. The investment of resources is subject to companies such as the one that uh, develop mining, uh, activities which provide some resources for these schools to be sustained. A large number of children and adolescents in residential school, these are 569 headquarters and they are located in at least 23 departments because these are not only in the area of the Amazons where the indigenous people are concentrated, but they are in different territories as well. In Cauca, in the Atlantic area, in Sierra Nevada, in different places where there are settlements of indigenous communities where children are offered to go to these residential schools. These boarding schools have history. They have been handed over to the Catholic Church during the first years of this century. This changed. Today, the Catholic, the Catholic Church is not in charge of these boarding schools, but the, it's still a very big issue because children, when they receive the education, they are separated from their community, they are separated from their language. And of course, we know that children do not go back to their communities when they grow up. They, uh, they separate from their communities. And there is an analysis that most of these children upon this uh, breakage of their family bonds, well, they lose their family language, they are used to the Spanish language and they are far away from their communities. There is also, it's also clear that there is a great incidence of suicide and alcoholism left by this school first because of the, of being unrooted from their family because of the lack of their family and they cannot access to universities so they are they have difficulties in order to keep on living some children do not find anything to do so they end up drinking alcohol or committing suicide as this was posed by Eric. It's necessary to carry out an investigation and an analysis of these places because I would like to invite to this session one person from the community, in the indigenous communities of those people who have lived these situations and it's really difficult to find them. I tried to look for them, but it's really difficult to find them because that isolation in which they are in doesn't allow us to follow up their situation, what they are living through. And I would like to end by saying that these residential schools are maintained for children, boys, girls, and adolescents with uh, disabilities. And this is something that for those who work in this uh, area also, is also important for us because these children who are more vulnerable end up institutionalized and they spend their lives in inappropriate places which prevents them from developing a dignified life in their communities. So I believe that states have to carry 
uh, keep on investigating and how is it that they, and they have to ask themselves, how is it that they can offer different things for these people who live in faraway communities and how is it that they can call them in order to create those links and those bonds to their families, which is the main right of children and adolescents. They need to grow up in a family who can provide them with kindness and with love and that can insert them in the community. These residential schools were justified because they're, they were areas of a war conflict, of armed conflict, and this was a way of protecting those children or preventing them from being recruited in the groups related to armed conflicts. But we know that the solution of protecting between commas, it's not to isolate or to separate. We should offer other solutions. So thank you for the invitation and we are at your disposal together with DRI in order to provide the information that you may consider necessary. I think that we are out of time. Yes, we are almost on time. I will ask my colleagues whether they have any questions, but First, I would like to let you know that what, strike, what struck me is the, the main objective was, I understand what you explained about the relation between boys, girls, and adolescents in situation of vulnerability and the indigenous people, but the hearing was requested on the residential schools but now you provide a greater focus on children with disabilities so as a commission we were trying to have like a kind of an organization because we were prepared to hear about the situation of these last few months about what happened in Canada and we know it's a practice in other countries but I will give the floor now to my colleagues I am reporter for indigenous people I had some questions to do but I will I will keep them for myself because I am a, a little bit um dizzy with the presentation I will see whether my colleagues have some more specific questions. We have Commissioner Esmeralda. Probably she has some questions about the residential schools in general. Commissioner Esmeralda, would you like to start? I give you the floor. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the three organizations who call for this hearing, then I would like to take the sentence put forward by the organizations, their response to the institutionalization of childhood, the focus on who are institutionalized. Indigenous people are institutionalized with these objectives that in the previous century and today can be excuses of protection, but at some point in time, it represented an answer to exclude, to isolate, or to destroy the language, culture, etc. Children with disabilities. At the time of providing an answer that the family needs, the state does not have a policy in place to strengthen the families so that 
children with disabilities can be attended to within the scope of their rights. And who are the ones that are also institutionalized? Poor people, those who do not have an answer at home because their mothers do not have an answer, their fathers do not have an answer, and they do not have the tools. They lack the tools that the society as a whole is demanding from them. And we all say the family is a basic stem of the society, but it turns into a box that resonates all the social problems. And the state also has the responsibility to provide assistance and to strengthen the families. And I would like to mark this link because it's important to identify the groups that have been and are still the subject of this response. This response is very easy for judges, for social workers and for the states. Well, I take them from there and I take them to a residential school that we're going to analyze. We have to analyze which are the answers provided by those residential schools. And this has also been determined by the Inter-American Commission in the report that was issued some years ago about the rights of children to live in family, with his family, in order to end with the institutionalization the Commission has posed a series of recommendations in this report to guide not only the state, also the organization of the civil society so that this answer can be effective and so that it doesn't turn into an excuse, the concept of the right to protection, what Mexico poses of about what happens with the children. Well, we have the answer for them to go to school because it's a right to education. Well, but we are providing the right of education, but I am destroying his family unit. I am destroying his culture or her culture. And I am also exposing the child to the risks. Why don't we have the schools there near the communities? That should be the right to education. The school should be near the community so that children can go to school. Institutionalization is really important. We have these three groups. I can identify them clearly, but in all our countries today, we are experiencing this. And we cannot understand that we are discovering the graves. That looks like a terror film. Phil where the children are buried, children that have been separated from their families and from their cultures, that cultural genocide in all our countries, these answer of institutionalizing children has to be questioned so as to comply with all of the rights of the children. In those centers, abuses are committed, children are exploited. We have a very harsh example in the International Day of Women to 2017, I think it was 41 
girls were burned in a place that was supposed to be a safe place. And I build this link, this bond, moving away from the objective of the hearing. But this is linked to, to this. We cannot separate it. The, we should differentiate some of the situations, but we need to end with institutionalization because the answer of states cannot be the euphemism of protection for the abuse of all the other rights, including their rights and integrity and personal integrity. The topic of suicide, the situation of permanent damage to children and adolescents. And then we ask with, with ourselves, why is there so much violence in the world? Why are there so many crimes in the world? Well, unfortunately, it is related. And I'm going to conclude with this. I'm sorry, Commissioner, but this is a topic to which I'm very, very committed. In the whole region, we cannot speak about a new normality post-pandemic. We have to talk about a new humanity because things cannot be as they were during the pandemic, before the pandemic, and the boys, girls, and adolescents require this protecting reality and the protection of their rights. Thank you, and sorry for the use of the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mantilla, uh, first Vice President of the Commission. Thank you, Madam President. I agree with you because the objective of this meeting, as we believed in based on the uh, situation, was the situation of indigenous children in the different countries. I felt I thought you were going to explain the link with disability. Um, so far, you, you haven't managed to do that. I hope that you can do it on the second part of the hearing. And also, we have heard about more general uh, references, but I would like to have more uh, specific data, maybe statistics, more geographical data. Has there been any, have there been any reports? Was, did any of these cases get to court? And how do you, um, what do you believe is happening? Because of course, yes, uh, rural schools are uh, far from, uh, um, from big cities. So maybe within the information you have, if you could focus on that aspect so that you could have more information about that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Marti Mantilla. Commissioner Margaret May McCauley. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, I thank um, all the speakers. Uh, I, I want to get very quickly to the points that I, I wish to raise. I agree with what has been said by both of my sister commissioners, but I want to say this, that I believe that this was a concerted act of governments to eradicate the identity of the, 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 the young members of the indigenous peoples because not only were they trying to erase their knowledge of their culture and language, they were, would during that period be denigrating it, which is why most of them when they finished school would not return back to their homes because they, they grew up hearing all the time your people are no good. What you do is, when you do this, it's no good, and so on. So they grew up with this denigration of where they came from, who they were, and everything was erased. And they, these children would grow up and be left in a vacuum, their identity gone. This was the most effective way of eradicating peoples, 
And this was a decision which was taken with the political intent to destroy. This is why I agree with Eric when he says that these were crimes against humanity. They clearly were, and definitely there was genocide. And not only were the children themselves violated, the parents and family members of those children, their rights were violated too, because no one was asked to consent in the sense of real understanding of what was the intent of, of these uh, um, decisions to go and, and, and take these children to boarding schools or schools of residence, which is a boarding school, wherever they are. And I am so angry when I think about it. And since the, the Truth and Reconciliation Com uh, Commission finished its report in Canada, as the Rapporteur of Canada, I've been trying to get a, a monitoring follow-up meeting to find out how many of the recommendations have been met by Canada. Indeed, for us to find out how many recommendations of the commission itself has been met by Canada in this regard. But all the meetings did not in fact happen. They were postponed to be fixed for later or something. Anyway, they didn't happen. And I am asking the Secretariat that we must move seriously with this matter in the Commission. These countries have to answer for this grievous crime. I mean, it's so egregious. It's difficult to think about it and talk about it without wanting to bash somebody. And I am a human rights defender. But I want, I feel as if somebody ought to pay for this. And this, this, the states have to answer, they have to apologize, they have to repair. They have to admit to their crimes because they are crimes. How could they? How could they? And yet all these states have constitutions which say everyone is born equal. And yet you behave that way to the first peoples, the original peoples of the land you came and captured and occupied. My God, Esmeralda, my sister, I think these humans are bad through and through. And I don't know if we can change them, even today. Because the greed of human beings is what pushes them. Because these lands had valuable minerals in them that they wanted and still do. So please, my, my sisters, members of the Secretariat, I plead with you, let us take these things seriously. And I'm very happy that Eric brought up the USA as well, because when I read the document, I said, but what about the indigenous people in the USA? It happened to them. And I watched a, a, a documentary about three or four weeks ago of the, of the peoples in Alaska who have to wait until the children are on holiday in the summer, and then they go to out camping, take them camping, the older um, people, and then try to teach the children their language and their customs again, because that's the only time that they have them. Nobody, no, no group of people should have to live that way. Because quite frankly, I believe fundamentally that you take my child, I have the right to kill you. And lots of people have done, and the law recognizes that right of defense. Because they kidnapped their children. And I mean, I'm sorry, ma Madam President, I'm going on like a crazy woman, but I feel absolutely incensed. My goodness. 
I think I better end there before I say too much and to say, how could this person be a human rights worker and speak that way? But I feel really, really angry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. I don't know if the executive secretary or the Redesca rapporteur or the um, deputy secretary would like to speak. Tania, no? Soledad, yes. Thank you very much, Madam President. I'll try to be brief, but I would like to thank you for the opportunity of attending this hearing, of listening to you. You have presented issues that are very important for my mandate in the commission, and it's an interesting proposal. I think it would be important if at some point the commission could draft a report as the one that is being requested, Redesca would be at your disposal to work on it along with the rapporteurship for the rights of children because the outlook you're describing makes us think of a generalized pattern of human rights violations, among them the right to education, the rights of children. We should remember that uh, general observation of the SC ESCE committee recognizes uh, education as an intrinsic human right and a means to um, exercise other human rights. So I was wondering if that, if we, it is acceptable for educational institutions to become deposits of children and, ch and of children. We cannot institutionalize. Um, indigenous identity. And I agree with the commission and the um, rapporteur for the rights of children, my dear Esmeralda, to uh, make a call for the end of this situation. And as I always say, you, you have Redesca at your disposal to visibilize this situation that so that goes against human dignity. As Commissioner Margaret, this is branded by racism. And I will add um, that there's, um, uh, a phobia to poor people. I mean, what? Uh, where is the right to education of their children? What kind of life can they they build if they grow up like this? And I would like you to um, uh, broaden the concept of social policy as an element for human rights, as you have just mentioned. Thank you. Maria Claudia, the um, yes. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet everyone, in particular, the civil society organizations. Um, this, the several issues that were presented here have been a priority for the commission in its strategic plan 2017, 2021, and have an intersectional perspective. So I found it striking I found striking what Eric Rosenthal said from uh, disability rights with regards to um, their, his experience visiting centers for persons with disabilities in Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, Peru, and the fact that he observed how there's a high index, not only of um, children and adolescents, interned in these centers, but also indigenous children. So I would like to know if you could give us more information about that concept, that uh, connection between the fact that they are um, excluded and the fact that they are institutionalized, but focused on indigenous children, which is the main point of this hearing. And also, it is an element, this element that was presented about, well, this was mentioned by uh, Lucia Cola, Monica Cortez, Mark Caban, uh, how cultural identity is slowly lost by these children after this thesis of kill Indians and save men or women. Uh, so these are very important elements that maybe with a bit more of a structure, um, you could use this opportunity of this hearing to uh, go deeper into these topics. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Maria Claudia. 
I agree with uh, Maria Claudia, and I would like to ask you to focus on some of the topics that were uh, the topics of this hearing. Right now, there was a story on the New York Times about indigenous children that have appeared in these cemeteries. And it's, it's something that has been a priority for the commission. We have had meetings with uh, organizations of indigenous women who are investigating this issue. We have been monitoring the measures implemented by the state of Canada that as the prime minister of Canada said is a true genocide. And, and based on this uh, committee for uh, the truth and reconciliation, the Canadian government has been implementing measures to face a structural issue. Uh, recently, they, they declared the National Day for Reconciliation in September. So this is an issue that we have been following closely and the Rapporteurship for Indigenous People is very much aware that unfortunately the, his, in the history of the region, this has occurred throughout the region and this continues to be an issue. But if possible, I, going back to what um, Ms. Pulido said, I would like you to focus or to use the rest of the time we have to focus on the issues the commission understood would be at the center of this hearing. That is because we have been following this situation. We have seen it in several countries in the region. In the region, we have mentioned Canada because we believe it's a state that even uh, with the horror it has been through, it has implemented some measures. So it would have been interesting to know your opinion as civil society organizations about these measures. We have asked the state to send information about these measures and their implementation. We understand it's a lengthy process, especially when we're talking about a colonial history that still persists today, but we would like to focus on that and whatever information you have from any other countries you have mentioned with this um, assimilation approach and the impact these uh, residential schools have when they take these children from their communities, maybe not with bad intentions as a rapporteur for indigenous peoples. I always remember a visit in Brazil. I visited a home for children and there was a boy of the, uh, the Guarani people. He did not speak Spanish. He was at this home with a, a couple. Uh, they treated the, the child very kindly, but he showed me his room. He had a beautiful bedroom. Everything was very pretty. And he said that he slept on the floor because his community slept on the floor. So I think that's an example of how some initiatives try to improve the situation but they they um fail to see the impact on the culture of these children by taking them from their territory their culture their community and as is established on the report uh, mentioned by commissioner esmeralda that is the commission has about institutions in this case there's a vicious circle when children are removed from their community because these children, once they are adults, they uh, reproduce with their children this abuse. There are high rates of alcoholism or uh, suicide because they have been um, removed from their culture and their community. So I would like to know what you think about that and what you pointed out at the beginning of this presentation. You were going to explain this connection between children with disabilities and indigenous children. So I would like you to use this uh, remaining time to explain that because that was the topic that we were supposed to discuss in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you, executive secretary. Uh, thank you all for your questions, for expressing this wish to learn about the issue. I was going to make a presentation about the link but we were we ran out of time. But I would like to start by mentioning what you are saying, Madam President. What we have seen in the region is that unlike the US and Canada, 
where in the last century they were they had a very clear objective to eradicate the indigenous culture and well killing the indian and saving men in the rest of latin america this objective is not explicitly eradicating the indigenous communities the practices that are being carried out in countries in the region end up with this result, even unintentionally. They are disrupting the social fabric of these communities. So as you're saying, Madam President, in the indigenous communities, uh, the practices of the state, some of them are not ill-intentioned. Sometimes they wish to provide education or they want to make sure that, well, these kids go to school. But the consequences um, on children and adolescents are very serious. That is why the approach of this uh, hearing was the issue of the institutionalization that goes hand in hand, as Commissioner Rosemena was saying, with the issue of disabilities and other marginalized groups. And, and this, the response of the state is always institutionalization and segregation. Now, I'm not going to uh, make my, own present, my entire presentation, but I did want to go back to the link between um, this residential schools, indigenous children, the use of residential schools for the use in Canada and many other countries in a region. Uh, poses an important question from the, um, we believe at least, for us it's very important, it's a legal question. When is a residential school an institution and when does this the placement in these schools is a way of uh, deprivation of liberty? This is a discussion that's being, uh, that's occurring right now. That is why we believe there's a link internationally it's this is happening at the UN committees for uh, disabilities and children about um, residential schools and other kinds of envi residential environments like group homes. At the core of this discussion, the question is whether placing children in residential schools is a violation and if it is, then what kind of reparations are they entitled to? And I think the Canada example is quite pertinent because it sheds some light on the possible reparations um, in the cases of, for example, indigenous children in Latin America that are being placed in uh, residential environments. Even though this, we believe that when the links of a family, of a, of a child with their family and community are broken or disrupted, and there are elements of coercion, of discrimination in placing them in these uh, institutions, we can um, say that there is a violation to the right to freedom and family and life in community. This according to the standards of the Committee on Disability and the Committee on Childhood. In the case of Mexico and Colombia, there are elements of discrimination and coercion in the placement of uh, residential schools in Mexico and Colombia, and that their links with their families and communities are threatened by these uh, placements and not only their uh, these links but the very social fabric of the communities if a child is sent to a residential environment and is removed from their ethnicity that is a form of discrimination And um, Eric Rosenthal was already mentioning that we have found that in the region, children with disability and indigenous children are placed in a disproportion, in disproportionate numbers in these kinds of institutions. 
And this presupposes that if a state policy calls for the placement of children and, adol and adolescents in these kinds of schools based on their personal characteristics, because they belong to an ethnic group, for example, this is a form of discrimination promoted by the state which might also be a systematic violation of the right to non-discrimination. In the case of Colombia, that's interesting because Colombia, even though it started as in the case of Canada, and it was the same model, the Catholic Church had these boarding schools and a specific policy which was also called, they called it civilizing uh, indigenous peoples. And what we saw in that case is that they would beat them if they spoke their native tongue, they wouldn't let them go back to their communities. They would beat them if they wanted to practice certain religious uh, rituals. But as Monica said, there was a transition from this practice that was based on the church and the idea of eradicating this indigenous culture, because now it has transitioned and now it's trying to educate um, children of indigenous descent or indigenous children in these institutions, even though they're saying that they're now they want to educate them, but the result is the same. And this happens in communities as well, because children and adolescents become isolated from their families. Some of them go back to their families, uh, stop going to their families, uh, or sometimes families stop going to get them. So there's the disruption between the, in the connection between teenagers and, adult, and children and their communities. And in the end, Children do not go back to their communities. Communities are left without children and adolescents. Uh, these children end up in uh, towns near these schools, and since they cannot pay studies or university, uh, or university, they end up killing themselves or uh, becoming alcoholics. So that is why the, that explains the rise in the um, alcoholism of uh, uh, indigenous youngsters, many of them who have graduated from these institutions. Um, there are some numbers in the case of Colombia, according to the state and other organizations that have been investigating the issue. Nowadays in Colombia, there are uh, 35,000 children and adolescents in 650 residential schools located in 23 departments, among them Meta, Tucumayo, Taupes, Pichada, Casanal, Guaviare, Guainia, Amazonas, Arauca, Bolivar, and La Guajira, among others. These departments are concentrated in the Amazonia um, region in Colombia. Now, in Mexico, what Laura was saying and what we have found is that the um, separation of families is unavoidable based on the state policies because the state's policies are not explicitly directed to killing indigenous persons or killing the, the indigenous persons uh, who live within this, uh, in these adolescents and children, but they do end up disrupting the uh, social fabric of these communities. Schools are very far away. Children cannot attend. So when they cannot attend, the state take their children from their mothers and send them to these institutions. And this lack of options for indigenous communities in terms of education uh, makes this state agents send them to um, residential schools. So there is some sort of coercion here to send these children to residential schools. And what Laura was saying is that it's very difficult for mothers to get their children back once the state takes them because 
the state usually asks for a fixed address to send their children back, but these are these communities live in communes. They do not have a fixed address, and they the state also requires that the children attend school. But how can they go if they are they live too far away from schools? They have to walk miles and miles, and there have been cases of girls who are raped on their way back from school. So as um, the rapporteur mentioned, and also Eric, this we believe this is something that needs to be investigated, even though the Canada and US examples are very important because um, they give us an idea of the severity of the situation, of uh, the discrimination against indigenous children and adolescents, and they are locked up and abused and they have their identity attacked. What we're seeing now, or what we are concerned about in the region, what we see right now is that maybe it's not done so openly. Maybe as the president is saying, it is well-intentioned. Maybe they're trying to ensure certain rights, but the consequences are just as serious for the children as for their communities. So as we requested, we believe it's very important for this issue to be investigated. And I also wanted to bring this topic to the commission because the commission has the ability, the capacity to carry out um, this kind of investigation. Right now, well, our organizations have a li have limited capabilities because of our regional re location and our resources, but the little things we could find find are very concerning. That is why we bring them to the commission so that we can ask you to consider this uh, thematic report about what continues to happen in our countries about the segregation of. Um, indigenous children and adolescents in residential schools or boarding schools. Whether it's an explicit policy or not, this is happening. Now I will give the floor to Eric Rosenthal, who just spoke, and my colleagues. Priscilla, I just want to say something else for with regards to Colombia, just so Commissioner Antonia knows that there's a close relationship between indigenous children who are victims of the armed conflict who uh, were, um, who suffered uh, who, the impact of uh, mines. So there is this ability there. And of course, a psychosocial trauma, which might lead them to alcohol and suicide and that has to do with uh, what this armed conflict and uh, the forced displacement in Bogota we are seeing a strong situation 1300 indigenous persons are living in a park they sleep in a park they were displaced by violence so that's very important for you to consider as well Thank you, Monica, and I will give the floor to Eric as well, and then to my colleague, Laura. Um, yes, I, I would like to respond um, to, um, I, I feel from the commission, both anger and frustration. Um, the anger that I have seen from Commissioner Makole actually, I think is great. It is deserved, it is overdue, um, and it is very much shared by us. Um, these are bad people. It is not well-intentioned. Um, it is a form of dehumanization at the most fundamental level. And I believe the dehumanization that we experience, that the only way children in Canada could be placed in institutions supposedly for their own benefit when they are ripping them away from the families 
and letting them die in those numbers is the same dehumanization we are seeing when children are being placed in institutions in Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, the countries that we are seeing. It is the same thing. You've asked us to show the linkage between the disability and the indigenous persons. I hear a great deal of frustration of uh, many of the members of the commission. You think somehow you showed up to a hearing that was supposed to be about indigenous people and somehow these disability activists are taking over and talking about disability. Well, I have news for you. It is the same population. It is the same discrimination. It is the same dehumanization. A child ripped from their family, the emotional trauma, the psychiatric breakdown that is caused is the same for these populations and the impact on the community is the same for these populations. The president of DRI did extensive work with the First Nation people in Yukon 25 years ago, 25 years ago, in which the re-traumatization of people who had experienced major mental health problems 25 years ago because their children were taken away and killed in the 1970s and 80s, we're still feeling it in the year 2005. And we have extensive documentation about that. And now why is it that it took 30 years after we went to the Yukon and we found that, and there is now a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and there is criminal action? It was a 30 year delay between when the documentation started to come out in Canada and now. We are asking this commission to save 30 years. Let's not wait 30 years to go through Mexico and Colombia and come out with the genetic and racial breakdown of the victims. We know who they are. Consider the outrage, 41 girls at the Ogar Seguro Orphanage in Guatemala were burned to death. They were burned to death because they were locked up in an orphanage and they were trafficked for sex by government authorities who were there for their protection. And when they protest, they were locked up and burned. How many of those children were indigenous children and came from indigenous community? I can guarantee you the majority of them were. The what was going on in the indigenous communities, many of the parents thought that they were sending them to these institutions for their own protection. Some of them felt that they had no choice. We have vast documentation that will make you even angrier than, you, than, than the stuff from a rich country like Canada who's had decades to find this. The Mama Rosa institution in Mexico we can bring you survivors, we can bring you indigenous people who were left, both girls and boys, who were raped and abused so many times they wanted to die. And why were they not kept in their communities? They were not kept in their communities because the parents who loved them and wanted to keep them were not given the support and care they needed. Now they happen to be labeled with disabilities. The words have changed, but the practices are exactly the same. We can bring you those survivors who can testify firsthand about that. Now, we haven't done that now because we're trying to save 30 years and get to the exact problem. And what we are doing is asking for your help. If you commit to doing a further investigation, to doing a thematic report, we will work with you. There, it's very hard to get into some of these institutions. It's great that in Canada, they have radar that can look into the ground and find the graves of the children who are unmarked. It's really hard to find unmarked graves. And I apologize that I can't give you any unmarked graves outside of the Mama Rosa institution in Mexico, but I can give you survivors who can talk about the discrimination that they experienced in their indigenous community and the rape and violence and abuse that they experience. And so this is the beginning of a process. Let's save time. I don't want to have to make the argument to make you believe that there's an overlay between disability and indigenous people. Let's break down the silos. These people are the most marginalized, dehumanized people in the world. The problems are vast. The numbers are enormous. We ask for your help 
in, in, in demanding access and demanding that governments respond, no child should be placed in an institution anywhere for any reason. And it doesn't matter if they're indigenous or not. And it doesn't matter if they're labeled with a disability or not, because whether they have that label or not, they're gonna be crazy after a short time being placed in these institutions and they may very well be dead. Okay, so that's why I'm asking for your help. We are committed and we will work with you and we will give you all the documentation we can. I'm, we are probably not the best position to answer the questions as to why Canada hasn't responded to the demands of the Inter-American Commission, but we'll try our best. Um, um, what we want to do is get this information out into the public and hold these governments accountable before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to make some clarifications on the position and the stance of the commission because we have a rule or procedure for the hearing and the topic. And this doesn't have to do with resting or diminishing importance to this. But the hearing was request, requested of the situation of boys, girls, and adolescents, indigenous, who were interned in boards, boarding schools. And there was not a hearing on the situation on people with disabilities who are institutionalized or people who are institutionalized in the Americas. These three topics are related. They're very important. And the Inter-American Commission has worked and has monitored for a long time in the special rapporteurship and in the rapporteur for the childhood and for indigenous people, and now the rapporteurship for disabilities. But if this topic was going to be posed, it, the rapporteur for people with disabilities should have been here. He was not here because we didn't know that that topic was going to mention. And we, uh, it's unfortunate that the rapporteur is not present in this hearing. He will be able to hear, but he won't be able to make questions. That is why for the commission, it's very important to understand the scope of a hearing and the topics that are going to be dealt with because according to which, or depending on that, we determine who are the commissioners and the reporters that are going to be present. In this hearing, the team for persons with disabilities are not present and it would have been very important for them to be here. So that is what we wanted to say. And I think it's important to clarify that. In second place, the commission has been working for a long time with this topic, which is the institutionalization, the reporters, for the children's right spoke extensively about a report and it would have been interesting to ask for a follow-up for that thematic rap, re, uh, report so as to see what is the situation today and up, up, as from there, we can see how is it that we can we work on that because there is already a report on that issue where the commission shed light on these topics, on the institutionalization of boys, girls, and adolescents with the specificities of the institutionalization for a boy, girl, and adolescent, but that's not the same for a child with disabilities or for a poor child. There are some things in common and some things that are not. And it's important to give the uh, different treatment they deserve. So that is what we wanted to mention at the beginning. I do not want to, for me, this situation is really important. That is why the commission has a report on the subject and has followed this situation. And we are really aware, I am also a reporter for Colombia. So we are aware of the situation that you post about uh, these uh, institutions and the impact that it, have, that it has for indigenous people and for the children in general. So our observation at the beginning of the hearing has to do with the need to be able to expose all the topics that are going to be treated in the hearing because here we lack the people that work with um, people with disabilities 
but that doesn't mean that the topic is not important for us. What I want to say when when I mean that there when I said that that there was a marriage that was a couple that was doing that was keeping a child, but they didn't understand the uh, effect that having this child had in the social fabric. Obviously, the institutionalization in the continent has had a, uh, an objective of assimilation, and I know that, it, that they are going to answer differently in the US and in the most poor countries. But this is something that we should keep on working, and it's good that you have called your attention about this issue. Obviously, this is a topic that the Commission will continue to monitor with um, intersectional perspective, but with the particularities of the different groups of children and adolescents according to the collective they belong to. We are going to keep on working together. We really thank for your presence here in your he, in this hearing. We will keep on working with civil society organizations and with the states that work on this topic. And I am sure that the rapporteur for uh, childhood will carry out a follow up on the situation of institutionalization in the America. It's based on the report that I think that was launched in 2017. Probably we can have a new perspective or a new look to that report. Thank you very much, all of you. And we are going to assess the request that you have made of producing a thematic report from the perspective that you indicated. And of course, that the commission has to assess the different priorities and the different requirements that are in place. But we believe that is a topic that should be assessed. And we're going to assess it together with the different rapporteurships that are involved in the topics posed here today. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon and a good weekend. Bye bye. Thank you. Greetings. Good afternoon.